I think you feel that at worst Gaia is the second foundation, said Codell. But the second foundation was brought into existence by Harry Selden at the same... The second foundation did not exist in imperial times, and Gaia did. Gaia, therefore, is not the second foundation. It is something else, and just possibly something worse. Brano's face showed nothing as she replied, I have seen that Gaia cannot be the second foundation, but as I told you, I have the full report of the scouts, and from that... Yes? Well, I know where the second foundation is located. We will take care of both, Lionel. We will take care of Gaia first, and then Trantor. It took hours, long hours, for the ship from the space station to reach the vicinity of the far star. A tether from the alien ship snaked out. The tether made a dull clang on the side of the far star. A black dot appeared on the hull of the other ship and expanded like the pupil of an eye. An expanding diaphragm, Trevis observed. A figure emerged. Human, said Pellerac. Not necessarily, said Trevis. It seemed an incredibly long wait, despite the quick approach of the figure along the tether. But finally they heard the noise of contact. It's coming in. My impulse is to tackle it, whatever it is, Trevise balled a fist. I think we had better relax, said Pellerin. You grow more sensible by the minute, Janoff, and I less and less. They heard the airlock in action. Then the space-suited figure stood before them and a forelimb rose to the helmet with its opaque visor. The limb touched something with a quick motion, and the helmet was at once detached from the rest of the suit. It lifted off. What was exposed was the face of a young and undeniably pretty woman. Pellerat was stupefied. Are you human? The woman arched an eyebrow. She touched the left side of her suit, which opened in one piece as though it had hinges. Her clothing was loose and translucent. Her hair was dark and shoulder-length, her eyes brown and large. Don't I look human? Pellerat nodded. Delightfully human. Trevise was frowning. Why have you come? I have come to escort you to Gaia. Her command of galactic standard was uncertain, and her vowels tended to round into diphthongs. A girl to escort us, Trevise snorted. I am Gaia. As well as another, she said, drawing herself up. Trevise shook his head angrily as Pellerat said, Young woman, what is your name? Bliss. Surely that's not all there is, said Pellerat. Of course not. Bliss Nobiarella is my name in full. Now that's a mouthful. What, seven syllables? That's not much. I have friends with fifteen syllables in their names. In galactic standard, bliss means ecstasy or extreme happiness, said Pellerat. In Gaian, too. Uh, my name is Janoff Pellerat. I know that. And this other gentleman, the frowner, is Golan Trevise. We received word from Seychelles. Trevise's eyes narrowed. How did you receive word? Bliss turned to him. I didn't. Gaia did. Pellerat said, Miss Bliss, may my partner and myself speak privately for a moment? Yes, certainly. Pellerat pulled hard at Trevise's elbow and was reluctantly followed into the other room. Trevise whispered, What's all this? I'm sure she can probably read our minds, blast the creature. I don't like being helpless. Who does? Pellerat replied. But acting like a bully doesn't make you less helpless. Oh, my dear chap, I don't mean to bully you, but the girl is not to be blamed. They found Bliss at the computer, staring at it as though she feared touching it. She looked up as they entered. This is an amazing ship. Are you really from the Foundation? How do you know about the Foundation? asked Pellerat. We learn about it in school, mostly because of the mule. Why because of the mule, Bliss? He was one of us. He was born on Gaia, but no one seems to know where exactly. Trevise said, I imagine he's a guy in Hero, eh? He had become almost aggressively friendly. He cast a placating glance in Pellerat's direction. Oh, no. He's a criminal. He left Gaia without permission. No one knows how he did it. But he left, and I guess that's why he came to a bad end. The Foundation beat him in the end. 
And who is Gaia? asked Treviz. Bliss looked puzzled at that. Just Gaia? Please, Pell and Trev, let's get on with it. We've got to surface. Gaia feels you can move much more rapidly if you use the potential of your ship. Would you do that? Just head downward, and you'll land at the right place. Gaia will see to it. The ship landed quietly, without a moment of jarring. They stepped out, one by one. The weather was comparable to early summer at Terminus City. There was a mild breeze, and the sun shone brightly down from a mottled sky. The ground was green, and in one direction there was an orchard, while in the other there was a distant line of seashore. Pellerat drew a deep breath. The air smells good, like fresh-made applesauce. Treviz ignored him. Could we now be taken to whoever it is that you speak of as Gaia, he asked Bliss. She looked amused. I don't know if you're going to believe this, Trev, but I'm Gaia. Treviz stared. You? Yes, and the ground, and those trees, and that rabbit over there in the grass. The whole planet and everything on it is Gaia. I think she means Gaia as some sort of group consciousness, Pellerat said. Treviz nodded. In that case, Bliss, who runs this world? Bliss said, it runs itself, in your own body. Don't all the different cells know what to do? Pellerat had been looking around. He turned to Bliss, and as if he was at the verge of understanding, asked her, Are you saying that the planet is a superorganism, and that you are a cell of that superorganism? Well, I'm making an analogy, not an identity, she replied. In what way are you not cells? Treviz asked. We are ourselves made up of cells and have a group consciousness. This group consciousness, this consciousness of an individual organism, a human being in my case, is far advanced beyond that of any individual cell. The fact that we in turn are part of a still greater group consciousness on a higher level does not reduce us to the level of cells. Pellerat said, I take it the group mind is much stronger than an individual mind. Consequently, Gaia can capture our ship, even though no individual mind on the planet could have done so. You understand perfectly, Pell. And I understand it, too, said Trevise. But what do you want of us? Why have you seized us? To talk to you. You might have talked to us on the ship. Bliss shook her head gravely. I am not the one to do it. I do what is best for me to do, and it is not best that I give you the information. Who decided not to assign the task to you? We all. Who will give us the information? Dom. And who is Dom, Treviz pressed? He probably has a larger share of Gaia than anyone on the planet. He is waiting for you now. Dom through Gaia has worked for years to bring you here. Dom was an elderly man, tall and thin. After he recited the two hundred and fifty-three syllables of his name in a musical flowing of tone, he said, In a way, it is a brief biography of myself. For fifty years, however, I have been satisfied to be referred to as Dom. He had brought the travelers into his home, and they had just more or less finished a rather indifferently prepared meal. Pellerat was staring at the remnants on his plate. He looked up and said, Dom, may I ask an embarrassing question? Dom smiled. Go ahead. I am anxious to explain anything about Gaia. Since all the things on Gaia share in the group consciousness, how is it that you, one element of the group, can eat this, another element? All things recycle, but nothing is killed for pleasure or sport, and we make no attempt to glorify our meal preparations for no Gaian would eat, except that one must. Then to what is eaten remains, after all, part of the planetary consciousness. When I die, I too will be eaten, even if only by decay bacteria. Some day parts of me will be parts of other human beings. I will be part of Gaia, and that's what counts. He saw the look on Treviz's face. Ask it, young man. How did this world come to be? In response, Dom began by recounting the history of humans and robots. He confirmed that Earth had indeed been the original home of humanity on which robots had been invented. He charted the historical development of robots, how they assigned themselves the role of protector of humanity, and how as robot technology advanced, 
their presence became more and more stifling for human beings. When robots became indistinguishable from human beings in appearance and developed telepathic capacity, which meant that they could monitor human thought, their presence became unbearable. Finally, the robots of their own accord, realizing the havoc they were wreaking on human society, ceased to exist. By then, however, millions of human beings had fled the original world. No widely available historical record of the robots remained because humans did not want to remember their humiliation at the hands of their robot nursemaids. If the galaxy has forgotten the robots, how is it that Gaia remembers, Treviz asked. We're different, proclaimed Bliss. Yes? In what way? Dom said, Of all the refugee groups fleeing from robotic domination, we who eventually reached Gaia were the only ones who had learned the craft of telepathy from the robots. You learned this from the robots, asked Treviz. Yes, said Dom. We considered them not our nursemaids, but our teachers. We are different in another way, too. We are unique in the galaxy. There is no other world like Gaia. How can you be sure? We would know, Trev. We would detect a world consciousness such as ours even at the other end of the galaxy. We detected the beginnings of such a consciousness in your second foundation, and it made us finally turn our eyes upon the galaxy, and we saw what until then we had been blind to. We recognized that eventually a dangerous crisis would come upon us, and it has. What sort of crisis? one that threatens us with destruction. I can't believe that, said Treviz. You have a group consciousness that can pluck a ship out of space. Nothing should worry you. We are not worried, Trev, said Bliss. You will handle it. Me? Get brought you here by means of a hundred gentle manipulations, said Dom. It is you who must face our crisis. Slowly, Treviz's expression changed from stupefaction a gathering rage. Why, in all of space, me? I have nothing to do with this. Nevertheless, Trev, you, in all of space, only you. George Endeball was edging toward Gaia almost as cautiously as Treviz had. At his side was Suranovi. Master, is that the sun that shines on Trantor? Is it the Hamish sun? Jendabal said, No, Novi, it is a far different sun. Uh, I have known this with my head. How is it, Master, that one can know with the head and yet not believe? Jendabal smiled. In your head, Novi. Having thought of her mind, he was impelled to enter it. He stroked her mind gently just a soothing touch of the mental tendrils to keep it calm, and was about to leave it, when something drew him back. What he sensed was indescribable in any but mentalic terms, but metaphorically there was the faintest possible glow. Novi's brain glowed. Mayor Harla Brano smiled grimly and pointed. By her side, Lionel Codell said, Come forth, ship. But without Kampor aboard, said Breno, one of our scout ships observed the changeover. Two people from another ship boarded and Kampor later moved off onto theirs, she rubbed her hands. Treviz fulfilled his role perfectly. He drew the lightning. The ship that stopped Kampor was Second Foundation. I wondered if Kampor might not be under Second Foundation control, so I had his ship equipped with a defective computer. When he managed to follow Treviz through multiple jumps without trouble, my suspicions were confirmed. Earlier you said that you would take care of Gaia first, said Cadell, and then Trantor. I deduced from this that the other ship was of Trantorian origin. Are you surprised? Brano asked. With hindsight, no. And our next move? We are going to challenge that second foundationer we now face. In fact, we're moving toward him right now. Jendabal and Novi sat together, side by side, watching the screen. Novi was frightened. The Foundation warship was approaching slowly, deliberately. Carefully, Jendabal probed Novi's mind. 
She could not sense mentalic fields consciously, whereas Genderball's mind could. Yet his mind had no response to such feeble mentalic fields as hers apparently did. But the glow in Novi's mind was not growing stronger as the Foundation warship drew nearer. If the warship possessed mentalics, and if it felt quite certain it was approaching a second Foundationer, would it not increase the intensity of its field to maximum before advancing? Yet Novi's mind registered no increased response of any kind. Confidently, Genderball eliminated the possibility that the warship possessed mentalics. The mentalic field, of course, still existed, but it had to originate on Gaia. The warship was approaching quite rapidly now. Genderball calculated that the strength of his mentalic push would be sufficient. There would be no pain, scarcely any discomfort for those on board the Foundation ship. He narrowed the mentalic field controlled by his own mind, then let it intensify and leap the gap between the ships. Nothing happened. Genderball fell back in numbed surprise. The Foundation warship did indeed possess a most efficient mentalic shield, which worked by gaining in density in proportion to the gain in intensity of the attacking mentalic field. Ah! He has attempted an attack, Lionel. See, said Mayor Brano. The needle on the psychometer moved and trembled in its irregular rise. The development of the mentalic shield invented by Arkady Darrell's father had been the secret project of Foundation scientists for a hundred and twenty years. But no advance would have been possible without the invention of the psychometer that acted as a guide, indicating the direction and amount of attack at every stage. Calling the ship Bright Star and its occupants, Brano sent out. You have forcibly taken a ship of the Navy of the Foundation Federation in an act of piracy. You are directed to surrender the ship and yourselves at once or face attack. Mayor Brano of Terminus, I know you are on the ship. The Bright Star was not taken by piracy. I was freely invited on board by its legal captain. I ask a period of truce that we may discuss matters of importance to each of us alike. Man of the Second Foundation, said Brano, understand your position. We know you are from Trantor, and we are not prepared to listen long. Then let me speak quickly. Your shield is not perfect and cannot be. The instant you attempt to use any weapon, I will strike you. Without a shield, I can handle your mind smoothly and do no harm. With the shield... You know you cannot do as you say. Do you then wish to risk the consequences? On Brano's ship, Lionel Codell whispered something to the mayor. I follow your thoughts, Codell. No need to whisper. I also follow the mayor's thoughts. She is irresolute, so you have no need to panic just yet. The shield can be strengthened, said the mayor defiantly. So can my mentalic force. But I sit here at my ease, consuming merely physical strength to maintain the shield, and I have enough to maintain that shield for a very long time. You must use mentalic energy to penetrate the shield, and you will tire. Brano placed her hands in her lap. I will wait. You will tire, and when you do... The orders will go out. Mayor, don't you see that if I feel myself tiring, I can save my world very simply by destroying you before my strength to do so is gone? You won't do that. Your main task is to maintain the Selden plan. Are you willing to gamble on my reluctance to destroy you? Brano took a deep breath and firmly said, Yes. By her side, Codell paled. Genderball knew he had to concentrate on the mayor. Everything he had said was true. He could smash her at the cost of an enormous expenditure of mentalic force. For the moment, he touched Novi's mind to make sure that the flow was still there. It was unchanged. He turned back to Brano. Mayor Brano, your gamble is a good one in this respect. I do not wish to destroy you at once, since I think that if I explain something to you, you will listen to reason. Suppose you win out and I surrender. What follows? In an orgy of self-confidence and in undue reliance on your mentalic shield, you and your successors will attempt to spread your power over the galaxy with undue haste. 
In doing so, you will actually postpone the establishment of the Second Empire, because you will also destroy the Selden Plan. The majority of the galaxy is still non-Foundation, and to a great extent anti-Foundation. If the Foundation moves too quickly in the wake of my surrender, it will force the rest of the galaxy to unite and rebel. You are threatening with clubs of straw. We have the power to win easily against all enemies. Even if you were right, Second Foundationer, it's a risk we must take. Mayor Brano, said Jendabal, forget the Selden plan. You do not understand its mathematics, and you cannot visualize its pattern. Mayor Brano, listen to me. We are in the vicinity of a planet called Gaia. It is probably the birthplace of the mule. The planet is surrounded by a mentalic field. It is the home of many mules. What harm have Second Foundationers ever done you? Specific rather than imagined harm. Now ask yourself what harm a single mule has done you. I propose a truce. Keep your shield up, but at least be prepared to cooperate with me. Let us together approach this planet and I will nullify its mentalic field, and you will order your ships to take possession of it. How will you by yourself nullify the mentalic field of a whole planet of mules? I am not alone. Behind me is the full force of the Second Foundation, and that force channeled through me will take care of Gaia. There was a long silence. Then... I am willing to approach Gaia more closely, if we can approach cooperatively. I make no promises beyond that. That will be enough, said Jendabal, and leaned toward his computer. No, Master, Novi said. Up to this point it did not matter, but now, please make no further move. We must wait for Councilman Trevise of Terminus. Dimly, then more strongly, Sora Novi knew who she was. Not in years had she been so close to the globe of Gaia where she had been born. She had never really forgotten, but the facts were buried deep within her. But now it was time. She did not will it herself. The vast remainder of her was pushing her portion of itself to the surface for the sake of the global need. She remembered one of the life forms she had loved on Gaia as a child. Having understood its feelings then, she realized now that she felt like a butterfly emerging from a cocoon. Store Gendibal stared at her. What do you know of Councilman Trevise? He attempted to seize her mind and found it impenetrable. What are you? Master, Novi said with a tragic look on her face. Speaker Gendibal, my true name is Suranovi Remblastiran. And I am Gaia. She held him off, but could not keep her mind closed to him, or perhaps did not wish to. In seconds, the whole essence of Gaia was described to him. Jindabal slumped back, awed. A whole planet, alive and with a mentalic feel greater as a whole than yours is as an individual. Please do not resist. I fear the danger of harming you. Even as a living planet, you are not stronger than the sum of my colleagues on Trantor. They are merely thousands of people in mentalic cooperation, Speaker, and you cannot draw upon their support, for I have blocked it off. What is it you plan to do, Gaia? What I do now I do as Gaia, but for you I am only Novi. There was the trembling mentalic equivalent of a sigh. We will remain in triple stalemate. You will hold Mayor Brano through her shield, and I will help you do so, and we will not tire. To what end, asked Jindabal? We are waiting for Councilman Trevise of Terminus. It is he who will break the stalemate, as he chooses. What am I supposed to do, Golan Trevise asked, and why me? After Dom had pronounced Trevise the key to Gaia's survival, Bliss had brought Trevise and Pellerat back to the Far Star, 
The three of them sat now around the computer. The view screen was split, and it displayed two ships in space. Trevise turned to Bliss. Is there anything you can tell me now? On the large ship is the ruler of your foundation. With her is Linacadel. Trevise said, I take it that on the other ship there is one man, Mun Li Kampor, and that he represents the second foundation. Kampor has left that ship and has been replaced by two people. Storjendibal, an important official of the second foundation. The second person with him is Gaia. She, I, we all are capable of crushing him. Is that what Gaia is going to do? Crush him and Brano? Is Gaia going to destroy the Foundation and set up a galactic empire of its own? No, Trev. Do not become agitated. All three, Gaia and both Foundations, are in stalemate. They are waiting. For what? demanded Trevise. For your decision. Ask no more of me. I, we, she have said as much as I, we, she can for now. It is clear I have made a mistake, Lionel, Brano said wearily. Perhaps a fatal one. However, Cudell said, circumstances might be changing. Look, a new actor appears on the scene. He pointed to the new spaceship that had appeared on the screen. That's the far star, said Brano. I imagine Trevise and Pellerat are on board. A voice rang out in the confines of the ship's control room. Can you hear me, Mayor Brano? It did not consist of sound waves. Don't bother saying so. It will be enough if you think it. What are you? Brano said calmly. I am Gaia. All three ships were in orbit around Gaia. Trevise, Gendabal, and Brano all heard Novi, the voice of Gaia, in their minds. You are all free to respond in thought, said Novi. To begin with, we are all here by arrangement. In what manner, they all heard Brano ask. Not by mental tampering, said Novi. Gaz interfered with no one's mind. We merely took advantage of ambition. Mayor Brano wanted to establish a second empire at once. Speaker Gendibal wanted to be first speaker. It was enough to encourage these desires. You were a particular case, Speaker Gendibal. You were a person who would be kind to someone whom you had been trained to think of as beneath you in every respect. I took advantage of this in you and turned it against you. I, we, am are deeply ashamed. But the future of the galaxy is in hazard. We did this now because Gaia could no longer wait. For over a century, the people of Terminus had been developing a mentalic shield. The galaxy would not have been able to resist them. Mayor Brano had to be somehow maneuvered into making her move while the shield was still imperfect. Storjendibal was rising quickly. He would certainly become first speaker, and under him, Trantor would take on an activist role. It would surely concentrate on physical power. He, too, had to be maneuvered into making his move before he became first speaker. Trevise contacted Novi over his ship's transmitter, ignoring the effort to converse by thought. What is wrong with either version of the Second Galactic Empire? Novi said, The Second Galactic Empire, worked out after the fashion of Terminus, will be a military empire established by strife, maintained by strife, and eventually destroyed by strife. It will be nothing but the first galactic empire reborn. That is the view of Gaia. The second galactic empire worked out after the fashion of Trantor will be a paternalistic empire established by calculation, maintained by calculation, and in perpetual living death by calculation. It will be a dead end. That is the view of Gaia. And what does Gaia have to offer as an alternative, asked Trevise. Greater Gaia, Galaxia, every inhabited planet as alive as Gaia, every living planet combined into a still greater hyperspatial life, a living galaxy, and one that can be made favorable for all life in ways that we yet cannot foresee. And what is my role in this, Trevise said. 
the voice of Gaia, channeled through Novi's mind, thundered, Choose! Which alternative is it to be? Why me? Golan Treviz, you have the gift of knowing the right thing to do. You are, every once in a while, sure. And we want you to be sure this time on behalf of the galaxy. Once we found you, we knew the search was over, and for years we have labored to encourage a course of action that would bring the three of you, Brano, Gendebol, and Treviz, to Gaia. Treviz was able to maintain his composure. Is it not true, Gaia, that you can establish this living galaxy you speak of without my doing anything? Gaia was formed thousands of years ago with the help of robots. We understood we could survive only by the strict application of the three laws of robotics. The first law is Gaia may not harm life or through inaction allow life to come to harm. We cannot force our vision of the living galaxy upon countless forms of life and perhaps do harm to vast numbers. Councilman Treviz, decide. Gaia will follow. What must I do? asked Treviz. Place your hands on your computer and think. Wait, cried Mayor Brano. Councilman Treviz, the last time we met, you said, The time may come, Madam Mayor, when you will ask me for an effort, and I will then do as I choose, and I will remember the past two days. You were right. I am asking you for an effort on behalf of the Foundation Federation. I ask you to remember that everything I did, I did for the good of the Foundation. Do not destroy the entire Federation out of a desire to balance what I alone have done to you. I want you to remember that you are a Foundationer and a human being. You do not want to be a cipher in the plans of the bloodless mathematicians of Trantor. You want yourself, your descendants, your fellow people, to be independent organisms possessing free will. Do not be guided by narrow parochialism, Councilman Treviz, said Gendebol. You are and have been part of the Selden plan above and beyond your lesser role as foundationer. Do not do anything to disrupt the plan. The second foundationers will in no way hamper the free will of humanity. We are guides, not despots. We offer a second galactic empire fundamentally different from the first, an empire without bloodshed and violence, and not at the price of becoming one more atom in a galaxy of atoms, being reduced to equality with grass, bacteria, and dust. What if I will not make a choice, said Treviz. You must, Novi replied. Treviz sat silently. Free will, said Mayor Brano. Guidance and peace, Chendabal countered. Life, said Novi. Treviz looked over at Pellerat. What do you think, my friend? All three alternatives frighten me. And yet, a peculiar thought comes to me. Golan, when we first went into space, you showed me the galaxy. And I said... The galaxy looks like a living thing, crawling through space. Treviz was suddenly sure. He placed his hands on the computer. He made his decision. Mayor Harla Branna was watching the view screen. She had every reason for satisfaction. The ships of the fleet were, one by one, entering hyperspace and returning to their normal stations. There was no question but that Seychelles had been impressed by their presence. The state visit had been very successful. By her side was Lionel Codell. This military demonstration was a bold stroke, he said, and one, I admit, whose wisdom I doubted. The Seychellians could not help but be impressed. While they can be satisfied that they are maintaining their independence, 
they will no doubt readily sign a trade agreement now. Our concern for the safety of Trevise gave us a splendid excuse for staging our little show. Have you considered, though, that Trevise may continue to search for the second foundation? Let him, said Brano, as long as he doesn't do it on Terminus. The second foundation's continued existence is our myth of the century, as Gaia is Seychelles' myth. Speaker Stor Genderball, on his own ship again, had every reason for satisfaction. The encounter with the first foundation had not lasted long, but it had been thoroughly productive. He had sent back his message of carefully muted triumph. Later he would describe how a careful and very minor adjustment to Mayor Brano's mind had turned her thoughts from imperialistic grandiosity to the practicality of commercial treaty. Adjustment to the leader of the Seychelles Union had led to the Seychellian inviting the mayor to a parley, and thereafter a rapprochement had been reached. Compor was returning to Terminus on his own ship to see that the agreement would be kept. Jindabal knew he would be first speaker, and did not deny the importance of Suranovi's presence during his political maneuvering. He would not necessarily share this with the other speakers, but he told her, Oh! Master, she whispered gratefully. Deep within, where the enveloping mind of Novi could scarcely be aware of it, the essence of Gaia remained and guided events. But it was that impenetrable mask that made the continuance of the great task possible. How glad I am to be back on Gaia, said Pellaret. You know what Bliss has told me? Neither foundation is in the least aware Gaia exists. It's absolutely amazing. We know, you and I, said Trevise, and we can talk, but who would believe us? Besides, I have no intention of ever leaving Gaia. What? Trevise was stunned. I'm going to stay here. Earth is the past, not tired of the past. Gaia is the future, and do not laugh, Golan. I have found bliss. They were outside, and Trevise looked gravely at the land around them, and the distant sea, all of it peaceful, civilized, alive, and a unit. Janoff, what if bliss gets tired of you? He carefully asked. The historian merely smiled. I have already received more from her than I dreamed existed in life. You romantic idiot, Trevise blurted out. Janoff, I'm sorry. Forgive me, but I must talk to her. You'll lecture her. Privately, Janoff, please. I won't lecture her. I promise. Bliss met Trevise in a small apartment that had been allotted to him. Bliss spoke first. You disapprove of me, don't you? You are aware of mines and of their contents. You know what I think of you, and why. She shook her head. Your mind is out of bounds to Gaia. You know that. Trevise hesitated, then said, You are Gaia, and I don't want to talk to Gaia. I want to talk to you as an individual, if that has any meaning at all. I have blocked off Gaia, Bliss said. Then, first, let me tell you that you have played games. You did not enter my mind to influence my decision, but you certainly entered Janoff's mind, and at the crucial moment influenced him to remind me of his vision of the galaxy. The thought was in his mind, said Bliss. It was tampering, said Trevise. Kaya felt it necessary, Bliss admitted. Well, it was a decision I think I would have made anyway. I am relieved, said Bliss coolly. Is that all you wanted to tell me? No. When we approached Gaia, it was you on the space station. It was you who trapped us, you who came to get us, and you have remained with us ever since, always you. I am Gaia. No, you are not Gaia. I think you're more than Gaia. Gaia told us that it was set on its course by the robots that no longer exist, and that Gaia was taught to follow a version of the three laws of robotics. That is correct said Bliss. I believe that robots do still exist, but I believe they no longer serve. Instead, they rule. 
Ridiculous, snapped Bliss. Or supervise? Why were you there at the time of the decision, unless you are the supervisor whose role it is to make certain that Gaia will not forget the three laws, unless you are a robot, so cleverly made that you cannot be told from a human being? If I cannot be told from a human being, how is it you think you can tell? Don't you all tell me that I have the faculty of being sure? But from the moment I saw you, I felt uneasy. There was something wrong with you. I know you are a robot. Your calm assurance just now that you could block off Gaia and speak to me as an individual was the final clue. I don't think you could do that if you were part of Gaia. You are a robot supervisor, and therefore outside of Gaia. I admit nothing, but I am curious. What if I am a robot? What do you want of Janoff Pellerat? He is my friend, and he is in some ways a child. He thinks he loves you. I do not want him hurt. I will not have him hurt. If I have served Gaia, I deserve a reward, and my reward is your assurance that Janoff Pellerat's well-being will be preserved. Shall I pretend I am a robot and answer you? Yes. Suppose I am a robot, and suppose I am in a position of supervision. Suppose there are a few, a very few, who have a similar role to myself, and suppose we rarely meet. Suppose that our driving force is the need to care for human beings, and suppose there are no true human beings on Gaia, because all are part of an overall planetary being. Pell is not part of Gaia. He is a human being, and he wants to stay with me. Well, I want him, too. You might not consider me capable of love in some mystic human sense, but are you saying you would not abandon him? If I am a robot, then by the first law I could never abandon him, Trevis said more softly. And if you are not a robot? Then it is not for you to say anything at all. It is for myself and for Pell to decide. Bliss looked deeply into Trevise's eyes. I will treat him well, not as a reward to you, but because I wish to. It is my earnest desire. You did well, Trev, said Dom, but then you did as I thought you would. But not perhaps for the reason you thought I would, said Trevise. Is it your opinion that your decision may turn out to be wrong? Dom asked. In order to find out, it is my intention to visit Earth, if I can find that world. Why? There is a piece of information you withheld from me, Dom. Perhaps you had your reasons, but I wish you had not. I do not follow you, said Dom. As I was making my decision, I was using the computer. For a brief moment, I found myself in touch with all the minds about me. I caught glimpses of a number of matters that, in isolation, meant little to me. In Stor Gendabal's mind, I saw the clearing from Trantor's library of all references to Earth. I still do not follow. If information about Earth has been concealed from both the Second Foundation and myself, Earth must be important. Dom, I do not willingly accept ignorance. Tell me, why was it so important to keep the knowledge of Earth hidden? Trev, Dom said solemnly, Gaia knows nothing about such clearance. Nothing. It is not responsible. Trevis thought for a while. Then, who is? I don't know, Dom replied. I can see no purpose in it. The two men stared at each other, and then Dom said, you are right. It seems that we had reached a most satisfactory conclusion, but while this point remains unsettled, we dare not rest. Stay a while and let us see what we can reason out. Then you can leave with our full help. Thank you, said Trevise. The end for now. 
This is David Dukes. We hope you've enjoyed this double-day production of Foundation's Edge by Isaac Asimov. It was produced by David Rapkin, directed by Bob Walter, mix directed by Steve Gomer, abridgment by George Malko. This program is copyright 1992 Bantam Audio Publishing. All rights reserved.